person you should know about and who whom you should Google as soon as this is over if you're bored tonight um, is Kim Gi Chan, um, infam famous um, Korean photographer who I think is the first and really the most famous street photographer in Korea. And um, he, his specialty was Seoul Gomo, back alleys, I guess, as it were. Um, and the interesting thing about him is that he conceived of the back alley as the glue that around which Korean identity was formed um, in terms of what later <coughs> other discourses would be called Jung or that special Korean emotional warmth that um, Koreans claim that exists. Um, that was just defined by people living in close quarters with you know thin walls, you could smell each other's cooking, you could hear people argue, arguing, screaming at night. You know exactly what's going on with your next door neighbors. And that created the kind of closeness that you could define as a Korean way of living. Um, and he defined that through his photography in Seoul. And uh, you've probably seen some of his pictures if you didn't know that was him. And you'll see, I want you to think about the common things, the themes that you pick up with these famous Korean photographers, starting with Kim Gi Chan. And we're going to kind of fly through the old soul. This is one of my favorite Kim Gi Chan pictures. <laughs> because the thing you'll notice about his style, if you look at a lot of his pictures, is he has a very obvious sense of humor. And um, he always, there's always dogs in his picture. And the question I always ask is, you know, people ask me this question, you know, when I talk about street fashion today, or consumption. Well, you always take pictures of certain things. Isn't that just your bias? And you can ask the same question. Why does Kim gi always take pictures of dogs? Is he just really interested in dogs? Or is, are there just lots of dogs in the lives of everyday people? And you'll notice this in other photographers that we'll come across, such as Lee hyung Nook, who is probably not as well known amongst people not interested in photography specifically, but um, his pictures, I think, are very, are very important. Um, especially if you're thinking about the 50s in Korea. Like this one. One of my favorites. And I think that, I personally think that this photographer um, had the kind of Henri Cartier Bresson kind of eye with composition. I think, personally, phot photographically speaking, he's one of my favorites. So you should know these folks. That's E. Hongo. And this is, I think, one of his most important pictures. I use this a lot in class, actually. I ask students to break down the elements. And you see what's going on here. There's a lot about Korean society, history, all embedded into this picture. Because who is this guy? Sam Hamilton. Sam Hamilton. Well, obviously, I hope he's not here, but he obviously went back in time and uh, put on an American army uniform. So, what is this photographer trying to say about what's going on in Korea at this time? U.S. military presence. It's definitely U.S. military presence. And I think from a 1950s <coughs> Korean perspective, how was the photographer or the viewer in the 1950s looking at this guy? What kind of figure does he strike? Very well fed. Very well fed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's definitely important. I mean, we giggle these days, but you know, this is a time when you know, if, you, if you had girth, you had wealth. You could eat, right? Dominance. And look at his, look at his stance. And uh, he's standing in a public space, being very well fed, and uh, kind of a little bit slovenly, and smoking a pipe, relaxing. And then you've got a relationship between him and these people who are looking at him like he is from outer space, which socially he was in the 1950s. But there's, there's a baby there showing a new generation coming forth that's going to replace him. <laughs> that's true. I, I think. I like this woman, 
first, precious too. <laughs> and I think of Beetle Bailey. I don't know if anybody remembers this cover, but Sarge from mm -hmm. Beetle Bailey, mm -hmm. which may or may not have been lost on people at that time. And this is John Bonpei. I'm going to go through, I've only got one slide with him, but the pictures I've seen of him, he always has uh, animals relating very closely with people, which I think is a function of the fact that people in Korea at that time, even in Seoul, even in places that nowadays, like Ahyun or Shinsudong, are, um, you know, people had lived with, in close proximity with chickens, goats, not bears or tigers, but. Taemin <laughs> <laughs> Shik. So you got to know who he is. He, I think, is a well-known street photographer um, who really documented Kusan, which is not <laughs> as developed as Seoul, never really has been. Um, I'm not saying that as a negative. That's just the way it is. So if you've seen and you paid attention during the first scene of uh, Ode to My Father, or Gukche Shijang, you'll notice something interesting. Um, Chaemin Shik has a very different view. I think he's saying something about class here, obviously. I think of Chaemin Shik as a much darker, um, more critical figure. You guys know this guy. It's a very famous picture. And actually, at the beginning of Kukchishita, I was really surprised and kind of, kind of uh, tickled by the fact that they had an actor playing this guy, hopping along on one leg, selling newspapers in that, in that, um, in the opening of the film. And if you watch closely, they also had a little girl eating kuksu. If you remember that, so this is one interesting way in which I think photographers, much, much more than we think kind of seep into the public consciousness, especially as artists talk to each other. You know, when this director, you know, who obviously is looking at archival pictures and knows the photography of this time, um, is looking for an accurate representation of that time, um, suddenly these photographers who, you know, most Korean people don't know who they are, become much more important because they really define how people remember. And um, this is another good example. Im Eun-shik, who, I think, name-wise, is not necessarily a famous person. But um, this picture, importantly, I think, for Koreans in the audience, you know that you've seen this in your textbooks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what, did, what did the Chinese characters say on his sign? <laughs> right, looking for work, right? So, but the, the important thing the textbooks often point out is uh, what's the contrast here? What do you see over his shoulder? Hands. Two guys, ajushis in business suits, shaking hands, looking like they've got business to do, right? They're, they're obviously employed and doing something while this man isn't. So th there definitely is a way that there's an image, I think, because sometimes these pictures these days are a little bit political without meaning to be. Um, in my own photography, I took pictures, which I didn't prepare. Maybe I should have put it in at this point. I took pictures of two little girls who had, who had roller blades on in the early 2000s, and they were um, very cute, and I was going with them every day in my old neighborhood of Gongdok. And uh, nowadays, that back alley has become Jaya Pate. Right? That whole alley has disappeared, as did the train station. But, you know, they lived there at that time, and they would rollerblade every day, and I just decided to take their pictures. And uh, I showed that once in a forum like this, and the reaction was very negative, because uh, it was said that it made Korea look, and because it was black and white and on film, it made Korea look backwards, poor, and undeveloped, which is something that nowadays is a very sensitive, I think, um, sore point with a Korea that's very much looking to appear, you know, glass and steel, modern, hyper-developed. In fact, that was an issue 
with the uh, the Avengers shoot. One of the I heard through blogs, so I don't know where this information exactly came from, but I heard through the internet that um, one of the contract stipulations for the city was that you couldn't represent Seoul as a poor, undeveloped country. That was a major concern that the city planners had when agreeing to allow Seoul to be blown up and uh, filmed for Hollywood. So. I'm going to bring you back to Kim Ki Chan, one of his famous pictures. And um, anyone know the background of the um, the Unibra? There was a comedy uh, program. Uh, which what was the name of that program? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kim Mi-wa, who I had in one of my classes at Hongdae, oh. but I, well, but not that same Kim Mi-wa. <laughs> <laughs> She's a very good student, in any case. Um, so there's a relationship, and um, the funny thing is, when this show was popular, you know, it's a funny picture. Kids are funny, and apparently, in the back alleys of Seoul, that was a popular and easy subject to get you were a Korean photographer trying to document something at that time. So you see that relationship a bit there. But I want to move away from Korea talking about historical constructions, images of one's own country. And I want to talk about Robert Duano. And that was after this pronunciation, I'm pretty sure about because I asked uh, several French students in my classes, um, teaching photo classes, the proper pronunciation, because I've heard it all kinds of ways by American lecturers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Duano. Yes. Okay, good. I studied German in school. In school. So, um, when you think about Paris, what do you think about? Romantic. Hmm? Romance. Romance. Couples. Walking along, you know, accordions, things like that. Um, and I definitely know that you've seen this picture. I think this was one of the most popular dorm room posters of the 1980s and 90s. So I saw it everywhere, in America in any case. So Robert Duano, I think, was important for building a clear image of what, of what Paris looked like. Um, um, could I ask a question? Yes, please, uh, always. Can you go back to the previous post? Sure. Would the French influenced by Americans to take to make the would the French be influenced by, by Americans? I definitely think that there's probably a back and forth. Um, maybe French were watching American films and had a sense of what. Okay, I shouldn't. <laughs> okay. Um, probably there was a relationship between how people saw maybe filmic images of how couples behave and um, how they themselves should behave, or maybe the range of possibilities within which they could behave. And I think the same thing is happening here in Seoul. So I don't know what was happening in, in, um, in Paris in the 1960s, but I'm pretty sure that in a country like this, where I know for a fact, you know, I had a girlfriend here in um, 1994, 1996, when I was first here, and we didn't hold hands in public. We didn't do any of this stuff in public. And I, and I think um, nowadays, it strikes me this is a very different country. And I think that you see Koreans um, who expect to be able to walk, hold hands, touch each other all over the place, kiss, go into dark corners, because people at least still go into dark corners to do this, um, and have public displays of affection. I think a lot of that comes from film and television. And that influence, perhaps you could say, comes from the United States, because there's a lot of popular culture here. But maybe the same thing was happening in France, although I don't really know. Uh, that's French. That's French. <laughs> she's, she's thinking of the famous uh, photograph, I think, in Times Square at the end of the 1945 end of the World War. Ah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Who told you kissing is good? Yeah. 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 The nurse, whom he didn't know. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I don't know if there's, I'm, as a photographer, I'm sure, you know, street photographers, this is prime fodder for street photographers, people kissing. And it's the sort of thing that is technically not representative of what most people do all the time, I think, on the streets. But, you know, I myself, as I'll show you later, I take a lot of pictures of Koreans kissing in public. That's partially my bias, my thing, but I think it's partially enabled by the fact that there are lots of Koreans nowadays who kiss in public, most of whom are under the age of 30. But uh, in any case, they're there. So I think there's, it's partially both. I don't know if that answers your question. But um, yeah, I'm going to move to the next slide because I have and I think some, you know, as um, many African Americans think about Paris as a place, it was known for a place where blacks could go and have social mobility and be recognized as full, fully formed human beings, um, dance with non-black women in public and not be disappeared. Um, I think Duano's pictures are partially a record of that romantic view of an open cultural kind of France. And this is definitely the kind of thing I think of when I think of France as well. Sitting on open air cafes, drinking coffee. This brings me to Gary Winogrand, whom unfortunately a lot of people don't know about, but I think he's become very popular on the internet amongst people interested in photography these days. I'm just going to take a survey. How many of you have heard of Gary Winogrand? A few people. It's unfortunate because he was a great photographer. And uh, this is one of my favorite photographs to show. Because he's saying something with his, with his camera, not so much about what he thinks of interracial marriage, possibly. He has a sense of humor, sometimes a dark sense of humor. That I've done. But um, I think he's saying something about what's going on in America at the time. And... Uh, it's a very interesting photograph. At a time in the New York City, the name was the Bronx Zoo, I forget what zoo it was, allowed you to carry monkeys around. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think you, if you watch a lot of YouTube videos, you realize it's not a good idea. <laughs> and um, I think Winogrand was kind of partially insane um, because he was so obsessed with taking pictures. One of the things he said, was he just wants to see what the world looks like through the camera lens. He actually, um, in order to see the world, he has to take pictures of it. He had a very bad case of what um, has been termed fetishistic scopophilia, and uh, a chronic case. And uh, I really, I kind of understand because I have the same disease. Um, <laughs> because I think unless you have a picture of it, it didn't exist. And that's something that Winograd actually said when asked, you know, what happens if you don't have your camera or you miss a shot? What if you miss something? And his response was, well, it didn't happen unless I had a camera. So I think he had a very close relationship there. And he, he kind of got a lot of critical, um, he got dissed quite a bit because he made this, this book called Women Are Beautiful because he clearly had um, a case of the Fetishistic, fetishistic scopophilia, male gaze in overdrive. Um, and he made a whole book about just women he photographed. And um, he definitely had an eye for women. I like to say he had an eye for women, the gonads of a pervert, and was, some, and was saying something specific about gender. Although I don't think he realized he was saying something about gender. But you can kind of see he's being very critical of a lot of upper-class New York City women. And it, these, these people really bothered him. What I think is it really pissed him off. And his relationship with these women, I think, qualifies him to be the first street fashion photographer, unbeknownst to him. And I think if you watch nowadays, now that the 60s has become kind of cool again, I think a lot of our images of what the 60s was like partially comes from Winogrand's photographs. 
And you can see, a lot of times, he didn't hide. He actually, I think, was a little bit off his rocker. And uh, he would walk up to people with his camera and just stick it in their face and take a picture and kind of skitter away. <laughs> and uh, I think these women look very kind of surprised and dismayed about the fact that he's taking their picture. And uh, yeah, I definitely see, you have, this is one that has to be displayed large because, what, what do you think the reason he took the picture was here? If you can see in the back bra, she's not wearing a bra and it's cold apparently. <laughs> <laughs> or she's a little nippy. Kind of silly stuff. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I can see that um, he had women on the brain quite a bit and that really defined his photography. And um, so when you think about the visual landscape of, say, New York City, I think we don't realize that people like Winograd really helped create that, and other photographers as well. And they tend to take they tend to take pictures of certain things again and again. I think partially because they were there a lot more than other things. So if you are if you all remember the key master or the key maker from the Matrix, anyone? It always struck me. I mean, these guys exist in Korea. Uh, has anyone met one of these guys recently? They're kind of disappearing. The key makers. So it struck me that for some reason, somehow, the, was the Wachowski um, siblings um, put a Korean Randall Duck Kim, if I remember correctly, a Korean key maker. Why make the key maker this guy who's Korean, sort of, sta sort of stature, and just randomly a Korean guy who makes keys? I wonder if there is a relationship. <coughs> so this brings me to my photography. This is where it gets weird. No. <laughs> so I actually came in to Korea in 1994, but I didn't take pictures of anything. And um, I was, I consider myself a photographer since the age of, so since fifth grade or so. But, um, the funny thing is, I didn't take pictures of much my first time in Korea. When I came back to do my dissertation work, which I wouldn't finish for more than 10 years, actually, in 2002, um, I came in with the plan to do a photographic project. And a lot of that had to do with street photography, which was part of the plan. And it ended up being my kind of encounter with Korea and how I was processing living in a city like Seoul, which I thought would be a great place to do, you know, this kind of old-fashioned black and white film street photography because there's such a mix of old and new, of open and closed, crowded spaces, markets next to, uh, like Nam Dae be next to uh, Myeongdo, that kind of contrast. And I like to say I kind of learned about Korea through the lens, in a wino grandian kind of way. Okay, so... This is where it gets kind of tricky because I'm going to leave this nice and safe program that's working well so far. And I'm going to go to a piece that, um, from a photo essay I shot in 2000, um, mostly as practice for a proposed documentary that I was supposed to do, but kind of fizzled when I eventually came to Korea. But um, I was documenting the growing Korean-American community and a group of Korean-American known as KYCC, the Korean Youth Cultural Center. They're a group of Pungmo players um, who were busy being as Korean as possible in Oakland, California. And uh, let's see if we can get there without something bad happening. Okay. This is, this is about three minutes long.
So this section is pretty much establishing who the characters in the film documentary would be. And sort of establishing they have lives outside, but they're also members of this group. saying here is, oh, there's a white guy in this group. <laughs> So this photo essay was about them preparing for their big parade in San Francisco for Lunar New Year. Or 
acted like I believed them because I had no particular reason not to. They were there always. Not These a special day, like uh, solution time. No, they are always there. And uh, these two girls, they're always at this point in the Gongda uh, subway station, they're always on this level of the stairs, outside exit one. <laughs> but they stopped being there not too long after 2003, 4-ish. Maybe the profit margins weren't enough to support a middle school girl life school, lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> they graduated from school. Huh? They graduated from school. Um, <laughs> they weren't replaced by their juniors. This is another Euro <coughs> Street photography shot. Um, doesn't mean anything. I don't know if it says anything about Korea, but kind of. And I didn't really realize at the time. I mean, I was most struck actually by the two officers walking with their, you know, briefcases. You see army people, military people, all the time on leave um, in the Korean streets, but you don't often see officers go walking in lockstep, you know, dressed exactly the same. But I just liked her umbrella, and I started taking lots of pictures of young women with dogs. And I think I was, that's when I started kind of thinking about the conversation of, well, you know, about consumption, and conspicuous consumption specifically. That'll come up later. But some of my photography was purely anthropological, kind of. And, uh, you know, when a friend asked me to do her wedding, I overdid her wedding. <laughs> I, um, really got into the rituals, not ancient, traditional kind of Korean rituals, but the rituals of the wedding hall. And uh, so I just started getting into these wedding hall pictures. You know, when I had friends who had weddings, I would just offer to do their weddings. Just the wedding hall, the wedding hall part, the getting ready parts. The parts that generally the Korean photographers wouldn't do. And the uh, black and white kind of documentary style was kind of the thing in wedding photography at the time. So they were pretty happy. You can all still hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> and I started noticing that more and more pictures of women started showing up in my pictures, as did other people saying, why do you always take pictures of women? I don't know, I like taking pictures of women. That's the best answer I could come up with at the time. And uh, this particular picture took me about 30 minutes to get, because I wanted to get just the shot with her, obviously being impatient because she's waiting for somebody to come and showing that, you know, photographically. While also giving the sense of time passing, you know, with the blurry people, you know, walking past her. And uh, that takes dedication, you know, to wait around, or just being really, really weird, <laughs> to wait around for 30 minutes and taking pictures too, and not get caught, which I'll come back to also later. This is a little bit anthropological. I took lots of pictures of things that I found to be weird, like Christmas cakes, you know, which is unusual in my culture, until I think um, I realized from watching Love Actually, I think in 2004 or so, that romance and Christmas had been forever linked, even into the West. This is another pure street shot. I can't blow this up, but I can, I think I can use this, yeah, it's kind of cool thing, this app. If you can blow it up, you can see very clearly that he's checking her out. <laughs> and um, to take a shot like this, you kind of have to know the environment, you have to know he's going to do it. Whatever's going to happen, you have to know it before it happens, kind of. Otherwise, your camera won't be up and ready to shoot when it happens. So. At this time, this was an attractive, fashionable agashi in Namdebu. And um, this was a new thing. These styles came in. Anyway, I kind of just knew he was going to do that um, when he was passing by, and I was happy to get that shot. So this is the pure street photography aspect. Um, and as things go, there was a darker side to reality even in the 2000s, in Korean life. This isn't the most, this is the most creative sign, but I think <laughs> a little bit contrived. USA, the United States of, aha, guilty. I thought, I thought it was kind of bad, but I thought it was a bad sign, but this 
guy was looking at me like he wanted to hit me. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to capture that kind of negativity towards foreigners, which of which there was a lot at the time. In fact, that's one reason I stopped taking the subway in 2002 as a foreigner and learned the bus system, because I got so many people starting problems with me in the subway that I just said, you know what, I'm just going to skip the subway. Buses, for some reason, I don't know why, I still don't have a theory as to why this is, the, um, nobody really starts fights with me on buses. Maybe it's just because it's not underground or there's the sun or something like that. But in any case, there's a little bit of a darker streak here. And uh, you guys remember the two middle school girls, I don't know if you remember, but you might have heard, of the two middle school girls who got killed by the American, it wasn't an armored transport, it was a bridging vehicle actually. Um, and they were rolled over and killed. That started a huge anti-American upsurge. And um, lots of things, you know, I was kind of angry as a photographer, as an American too, not at the protests because they're anti-American, but because I had kind of believed the fact as they were told to me that the United States didn't apologize, which wasn't true. The United States refused to pay compensation, which also wasn't true. And I later found out that the people who were asserting this, most of the NGOs at the time, also knew these things weren't true, but were still spreading this information around. But I was just busy documenting what was going on. And sometimes the occasional negative things towards me, like in the last slide, but, um, you know, it occurred to me also as an American that maybe it's in bad taste if I were the people's, these girls' parents. Maybe it's in bad taste to parade their funeral pictures around alongside, and this was a common thing at the time, alongside the pictures of their dead bodies on the scene of their death. Which, by the way, if you've looked at those pictures, which were prominently displayed in lots of demonstrations, you would know that that armored transport, that bridging vehicle, had rolled over them, and their intestines had been pushed out through their, through their anus. And uh, that was a horrible sight, but documented and definitely spread around the internet and put on posters. So it occurred to me that maybe if I were the parents, I wouldn't want this to be, I wouldn't want my daughters to be the focal point of some huge anti-American thing. Something I said at the time, I said, well, maybe that's not a good idea. And people said, no, you're American. You can't say that. You're just defending me. I'm like, no, that's not actually what I'm saying. I'm actually, if you were the parents, would you want this to be happening to your daughter's images? And, um, yeah, actually, I was kind of vindicated, not in any public way, but um, Chosan, Wolgan Chosan, of course, Chosan, Wolgan Chosan, had an interview with the parents a year later, and uh, that's exactly what the parents said. The parents said, that they had asked the, um, the, uh, the organizers to stop using the images of their daughters, which they didn't do, they just ignored them completely, and they had said, we don't want to be involved in anything anti-American, because we're actually not anti-American. But, um, yeah, in any case, about that time that interview came out, I noticed this picture. And um, what struck me about this picture is, semiotically speaking, <coughs> I mean, they're, they almost look like funeral pictures themselves. Well, I can use this fancy thing. You've got black bands being invoked, and they're facial portraits, and they're being called by their first names in a familiar way, which is exactly how the two middle school girls, Misun and Tosun, were called. You know, people said things during the protest like, Misun and Tosun, we will not forget you. Right? We're going to keep fighting for justice, that sort of thing. And this is a, you know, a remake of a Korean traditional ghost story. Um, it's promoting this modern movie that was timed to release on the one, or just about on the one year anniversary of their actual death. Not the one year anniversary of the verdict, the not guilty of negligent homicide verdict that caused all the anti-American reaction. But to me it was a kind of a weird timing and the weird use of their images, of this kind of image. Um, so that's the sort of things I was picking up on in my environment in Korea. But this image really was unpopular when I showed it in Korean venues. 
and uh, people would always ask me, how can you show that image of Korea? Or why would you show that image of Korea? And I said, well, it's because it's there. <laughs> that was, I mean, that's, my, that's still my answer, pretty much. But I also have a real pride in this picture, because at the time, this picture was really hard to take. Not in the emotional way, but in, it was easy to take. For me, I wanted to have this picture, because this was a reality that I had seen. But technically, it's a hard picture to take. I took it on 1600 speed, um, special Fuji. It's the fastest um, color film you could get at the time, because it's really dark in the red light district of Chongyang Ni, which is where this was. Which is still there, by the way, contrary to whatever the newspapers are saying. Um, and uh, it was great because I got a moment when past two guys were passing by, and the, the young lady is, you know, hey guys, busy? <laughs> trying to get them to come in. And um, the thing I liked about the picture that's perfect is for those of you who are concerned about Chosan Kwon Chime, which is, you know, concerned here in Korea, it's a perfect picture because. You can see her facial expression. I don't know why I keep going over here when I have to use this fancy thing. You can see her facial expression um, enough, but you can't really make her out. If she were your cousin, I mean, she's got so much hair extensions and makeup on that you probably wouldn't recognize who that person is. So she's safe in terms of her chosanapon, but still it's enough to make out what she's doing. But I think that speaks to that concern that this creates a certain image of Korea. As you know, some Koreans said to me at the time, and how I learned the phrase, Naramangshin. And I'm like, Naramangshin, like the reputation of the nation being destroyed, that kind of thing. People were concerned about that with this street photography. So I like this picture a lot. So some people have said, well, you're American, how do you, well, why not? <laughs> because I happen to agree that this argument is pretty true, especially nowadays. So at this time, I'm picking up a lot of things that I think are reality in Korea, is part is current of thinking in Korea, but um, isn't necessarily a thing that people wanted to put into um, the international view. Not that any international people were looking at my photos at all, but that was a concern. But then my interest in pure street photography, you know, kind of shifted, didn't change, but I had noticed that I started to have an increasing interest in how women were busy with being women. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The process of being women, of performing gender. And uh, at the time, I kind of felt guilty about taking pictures of women just because I wanted to. And I think the um, economics of film, I worked it out one time. Each shot that I took worked out to be about 25 American cents. So with that, you know, in the film days, it's kind of like, well, I shouldn't be kind of creepy and take pictures of people. Plus, it's money. Every time you push a shutter button, it's a month, you know, a quarter out of your pocket. So I'd only take pictures of along that interest when there was a clear, seemingly smart reason to do so. Like when I saw this woman talking with her friend, for some reason I knew she was just going to whip out her compact and start looking at herself in the middle of the street. So I was I actually turned like this just the moment she did that and turned away. So I was very happy about this shot. But I started taking more and more shots like that. And for about I guess a year, any time a woman would pull out her makeup compact, I would just want to take a picture of that, as you'll see. At this point, I've got to stop, and uh, I had to split this presentation into two sections, because there's a 50-slide limit on this, on this um, program of mine, which I did not want to pay for the premium version of, because it's $100. <laughs> That's the only option. <laughs> Okay, start the timers again. I stopped at 45 minutes, so it's a mental marker to myself. So the Gongju Ot. So I imagined this kind of relationship in a place where little girls were sold 
clothing of a gongju, of a princess, and actual princesses, such as this one. I think you can see what's going on there, right? That's another moment where I was like, yes! Woman checking her makeup while walking past a picture of the ultimate princess. <laughs> I was very ha happy about that. And I want to talk here about gender performance and how I got interested in that. So I'm not going to go into this. You read Judith Butler, Butler and sometimes people are just like, ah, I don't want to read that. <laughs> because it's just, you know, one sentence is a paragraph, basically. But it's the idea that gender isn't a thing that's real, right? We all know that gender is constructed. But how is gender communicated? How is gender created? How is it argued? Basically, you performed. Gender is in the performance of gender, which is a simple way of saying all the stuff she's saying here. So you perform your gender, you perform your race, you perform your identity. Not saying that it's fake, but saying that that's how you understand that identity, is in its performance. I think sometimes people confuse that, say that somehow people are faking <coughs> their identities if you're saying you're performing blackness. I've always thought the one reason that rappers from the late 80s, like Ice Cube um, is a good example, quickly um, transferred into, quickly and easily transferred into um, convincing film actors is because they were so good at performing identity in the first place. To, to perform it on film or for the camera is not that big of a job, which is why it's if you watch closely, that's why Ice-T was actually a really good actor. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to win any Oscars with his roles, but I don't know if you know who Ice-T is. <laughs> no reaction to that. So again, this is me kind of chasing after that idea in the photography. <coughs> and I you know, when taking pictures of interesting subjects, I thought they were interesting just because of their height differential. Um, I kind of was interested in, I'm always thinking about gender more and more here. This was in Chunchon Station. I feel lucky to have gotten that shot. This is in Chumuro. I don't know if you know Exit 5 for any photographers. If you know Chumuro, you know that Exit 5 is an important exit. And here she was standing in front of Exit 5, looking, to my eye, very feminine, with her pink umbrella and her pigeon toes and the whole thing. This brings me to 2006, when everything went digital for me, which eliminated that 25 cent per shot um, limitation in my head, and uh, fashion actually helped make that process happen, because I had a friend who wanted to do a series of pictures for her online shopping mall, and uh, I realized that I couldn't do that without costing a lot of money um, with film camera, and uh, so she agreed to pay for half of a digital camera, which I thought was a good thing. I think I was, uh, I was underpaid, but there's a lot more pictures than I thought. And I moved to digital and then took a step in the right or wrong direction. Um, just background on this, on this site, <coughs> this new blog that I went into. I had already started blogging um, on metropolitician.com and uh, I decided to make an anonymous, weird website um, called feetmansoul.com. And at first it was anonymous because I was so embarrassed about doing this. Um, but I was later outed or came out as the maker of this site. Um, so I was actually really angry because I got into a book deal um, that went south because um, it was supposed the, the name of the book in the series um, was called Soul, Chaemin and Jiok. So, an interesting hell. And the idea that the editor pitched me was, your photography fits perfectly with this idea that soul is, you know, hustle and bustle, busy, but it's not necessarily bad, 
it can be kind of good and the soul has its own charm, right? That kind of way. So I said, okay, that sounds good to me. And I just jumped right into that and pretty soon found that they started vetoing certain pictures, namely anything having to do with not only prostitution, because that's kind of expected. So the prostitution shot X'd out, but I kind of saw that coming. But they started Xing out. Um, I made a chapter about soul nightlife. They started Xing out any pictures with um, anyone having any fun under the age of 25. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of weird. So I was mad because after a certain point, I said, you know what? I'm not going to make a brochure about, about Korea. I'm not, that's not my job. And uh, so I said, you know what? I'm, I can't make a book with my name on it with the ideas that you guys have. Now, you told me so an interesting hell, but you guys want me to make the Ewha Women's University, you know, you know, freshman year pamphlet. That's kind of what you want. You know, people walking, holding hands in the middle of campus, that kind of thing. And uh, so I said, okay, I'm, I can't, I can't go further with this project. And they were like, mm, return our money. And I said, mm, no, <laughs> because actually I did a lot of work for this, and you guys are messing it up. You guys are you know, become your big brother. Anyway, long story, not short, but um, I decided that, well, I was kind of intrigued by the fact that you could take a picture and it technically didn't cost you any money. So me and my girlfriend at the time decided that, well, I decided <laughs> that I would just start taking pictures of random women whenever I wanted. And, um, and I was kind of scared of, you know, getting into some trouble. So the idea was to make some kind of fashion-related thing, and at the time, in the States, the kind of fashion-related blogs that were really popular were shoe blogs. That was a really hot thing. And if you remember, in Korea in about 2006, that's when all the fashion newspapers, you know, you know there are lots of stories about shoe, um, online shopping malls. That's when also, unfortunately, if you remember this, the uh, Sex in the City thing was at its peak, and uh, people were starting to talk about Manola Blahniks in Korea, right? Koreans are not the kind of people that have ever been concerned about $800 shoes, right? Until a certain time, and suddenly I started noticing that people are really into their shoes. So I said, you know, if you want to make something that's kind of popular, kind of interesting, and kind of photographically, artistically challenging, and doesn't cost you any money to do, why not just take pictures of shoes? So I said, why don't we do that? And actually, I had my girlfriend at the time kind of running interference to make sure that I didn't get caught. She was a distraction. I took a picture of this woman at the bus stop for this first feature <laughs> of feedmansoul.com. And the other thing is, it's not really about feed. It's kind of a, it's kind of a pun because for those long-term veteran bloggers, of which there are not that many in this room, there was a site at the time called Fat Man Soul, which was a really good site, and um, was this guy who obsessively took pictures of everything he ate and talked about it, which at the time wasn't unusual. Nowadays, we're like, yeah, people do that all the time on Facebook, but at that time, there was this weird kind of obsessive documentation that I said, I would just take from fat to feed, and that's what I did. And it was anonymous for a while. Ten minutes. Yeah, I'm going to whiz through these, hopefully. So I started making this blog, and it went from overt obsession with shoes and trying to make you know something not very artistic, kind of artistic, into street fashion, which was starting to become really a big thing <coughs> in the West. But yeah, at this point, I want to talk about Cho San Kwan. And uh, this is usually the point when people start asking, what about the legality? And, you know, Koreans know the term Chosunkwan very well. And I want to clarify what, what's going on there. And one of the limitations of documenting the landscape of Seoul in Korea, what have you. So Chosunkwan, Chosun means your facial image. And Kwan is like the right, or the right to control one's facial image. <coughs> I think this is a central factor in shaping the attitude towards photography and street fashion photography. Which is one reason, actually, not to continue reading off the, off the slide, 
It's one reason that I think street fashion photography, if you think about it, shouldn't really exist in Korea, because people are really concerned about this concept of chosankor, and there's a low level of social trust. People don't really trust other people on the streets of Seoul, especially to take their picture and go do something with it, which was a big problem when I started doing that. And I just put in a blank slide there. Okay. So if you want to get into the legality of things, I just sort of skipped around. The um, Koreans enjoy certain basic rights, um, according to the Constitution, the most important of which is the right to privacy. Um, in the United States, for example, privacy, the right to privacy is linked to the space that you're in. Whereas in Korea, it's linked to your reputation, your face, losing face, right? And every citizen has a right to that, and I didn't translate that for some reason. And basically, as long as you, the only way you can get in trouble for taking the person's picture without their permission is um, by publishing it and that resulting in damages, which they can sue you for in civil court, which is why the, the only extent to which taking the person's picture without the permission is criminal law is to the extent that you establish that something was done wrong so that they can sue you for it. But it's effectively, you, you can't get really into criminal trouble. There's no stipulation for going to jail for taking a person's picture without their permission. That act itself. But there's this misconception these days that taking a person's picture without their permission is illegal, which is not technically true. But since 2013, that changed with the Special Sexual Crimes Law, of which Article 14 says the use of cameras and blah, 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 blah. You can't take a, if you take a person's picture and it's judged to be of a sexual nature and causes embarrassment or shame to the victim, that's punishable by a criminal fine or jail. And that's, it's only been dangerous to do this since about 2013. And uh, I tell my students basically, this is what you have to watch out for, because generally only people prosecuted for this are men, obviously. And uh, what I notice in the summers, you always get a few newspaper stories of brown men, Pakistani, Indonesian, Malaysian guys who are on you know, one week vacation from their factory and take out their DSLR and go to the beaches in Busan and say, oh wow, look at this permissive culture where girls walk around in their bikini, bikinis and stuff, and they take a picture, the girl reports them to the police and they get arrested. In fact, I had a person Facebook message me in desperation in relation to an article I wrote about this in my blog, saying, I'm in, I'm in jail right now, I need to <laughs> I'm really the wrong person to call. I think you need somebody who can actually help you out of jail. But um, <laughs> that's not me. I, did, I, I blogged about it a little bit, but, uh, yeah. So what I want to argue, though, um, I'll bring this to a close, hopefully as quickly as possible, is um, that we've moved from the Kolmo to the Norito. And I, remember, Kim Ki-chan said that the organizing principle, or I guess the glue of Korean ness is, or was, the Kolmo. And now that the Kolmo have disappeared, what is that? I kind of think there's something else going on here. I think that the norito, the playground, is kind of what defines public spaces in Korea. And uh, I think you can see this, <coughs> how things have changed. As I'm, and this is the change in thinking that I started noticing as I started doing street fashion photography. And what I'm arguing is that people consume or use public spaces according to their desires. Nowadays, something that would have been pretty unimaginable to do even 20 years ago. Um, because I think if there was a higher expectation, you're in a public space, you have to conform to your social role, especially if that's related to gender and your age and things like that. But nowadays, you can walk around and see high school kids in their uniforms holding hands and doing more out in public. And there was a time in Korea where an adult could come and scold them for that. But nobody does that anymore because everybody expects to be able to be who they are, to express themselves as consumers. 
And uh, what I'm going to do is take you to Yongsan in five minutes. This is one run. Oh, I just went to the next slide. <laughs> hope this works. This is one, so the reason I like this progression of images is because this is literally a five minute stretch of time. When I walk from the fifth or the sixth floor, I think the fifth floor, from the Yongsan CGV down to the first floor and to take a taxi, because that's what I do. In that time, you know, these are the good shots, but there are more couples. <coughs> okay, I think I skipped a couple. But I've, I came across several couples out being very public and cute in their displays of affection. And it was topped off by getting to the first floor and getting to walk right in front of a couple that was kissing in front of me. And uh, that was pretty interesting to me. <coughs> and these are, these are some of the photographs that I'm taking these, I tend to take these days. And Flickr isn't working so well for me here. Yeah, there we go. A CGV Sala. I'm interested in the way that tradition is also harnessed towards the needs of capital. And this is a time when you notice people carrying strange things around. You know, Starbucks coffee is one thing, but CGV popcorn is another. <laughs> Come on. Oh, this was working so well. Next. Okay, I've got to select them. I think you can see kind of what's going on here. I'll just <coughs> From CGV popcorn to the third one, where actually I think I have my laser pointer with me. I don't. I do. I usually use this for my cat, but. <laughs> so you've got this picture of Ajimas literally fighting each other for this sale that opened up. They brought a cart of clothing and it was like velociraptors on me. <laughs> and uh, lately I've been noticing the particular major gender consumption that goes on in Chongyinan, um, Hebangchon, where I live now. Now there are literally swarms of young women who come to go to the Machi to consume foreignness, I think, um, these days. Coca-Cola. This is the typical sala these days. Hanboks and cola and popcorn. I take pictures of a lot of ads as well. Street fashion, young students with expensive cameras, things like that. Um, so I don't think I'm going to go further into this, these slideshows. Oh, one last one before I wrap things up. Okay, that's not the link. <coughs> okay, this would be a good time as I go for my um, flicker for any comments or questions. Okay. Yeah. Question time. Thank you very much. Big 
much. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, first of all, Michael, happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Yes, indeed, yeah. happy birthday. And secondly, I was uh, a little interested to hear a bit more about your techniques, especially how they've changed over the years. It, uh, all right. it seems like early on you were doing a lot of uh, um, uh, very candid photography. I was actually very curious, looking at some of the pictures, how exactly you were holding your camera. Obviously, you don't seem to do that much anymore, but like, was it? What, what was your technique? Basically, my question. Uh, I pretty I use a lot these days. Um, Sometimes I, I do ask for portraits, and that gets me more attention. People tend to like that more. Yeah. In particular, the, the one of the girl waiting, holding the umbrella, looking at her watch. You were there for a while. Uh, well, the thing I always say is, most people, when you're in front of people in public places, they expect people to do what they're supposed to do, which is not stare at people or do this. And if you do this, most people are just an autopilot. As soon as you do this, they're gonna, gonna enter their radar. They're gonna wonder. People are gonna wonder, why is that person taking a picture of me? But if you do this, most people don't expect. I mean, I'm not hiding the camera. I don't have secret fiber optics. <laughs> most people don't expect that. You know, even if you walk up to them, <laughs> they don't expect that you're gonna be taking that picture. So, and most people are doing what they need to be doing. Um, you know, if they're on the phone, they're only concentrated on the phone. They don't have any awareness of what's going on around them. So that's why you shouldn't text and drive, because it's like you're driving blind. But you can walk right up to a person on the phone, and I've shown this to my students before, and just <laughs> take their picture without them ever really noticing it. Ah, yeah. 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 Uh, in your photos, you show an uh, evolution of women's fashion. Do you <coughs> notice uh, any evolution in men's fashion as well, especially? Nowadays, with well, what I see in Yeongdong, for example, a lot of mm, uh, men and cosmetics and things like that. Um, I don't know about specific um, fashion trends or anything. Because I actually don't do fashion. I don't. I'm not fashionable. Um, <laughs> I have noticed things as a photographer, like oh, people are wearing from about last year in Korea. In any case, people are wearing that. You know that witch hat that people have been wearing a long time. Mm. Right? They're wearing hats now. I noticed things like that, so I start taking pictures of hats. But um, in terms of men's fashion, I just think that generally men's fashion has improved. Men actually take, you know, they, they pay attention to what they wear. Where, as I remember um, when I was here in the 90s, going to the movies and seeing well-dressed Korean woman and her, hu her, her husband or her or a boyfriend wearing slippers and shorts. And uh, yeah, that happened a lot more. Men don't do that anymore. I noticed that men put a lot of effort into it. And um, in terms of specific trends, I don't really pay attention to those too much, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that um, women were expected to be less just the bragging object of a man and expected to come up with their own, make, put their own game face on as well, as it were. Yeah. I don't know if that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in all your photos, you show in an art, and I know that you comment on uh, social context like political events like social media and too many. Of the Korean, but in uh, latest photos, uh, I cannot see, I cannot hear any your comment or critics on fashion and why. Oh, the recent, you mean recent photos or which photos? Yeah, why you take photos and those photos and you have any answer, any uh, context to tell us about the social meaning of the fashion? I generally think of the pictures I take these days as, um, you know, I'm interested in how gender is argued out in the public sphere, but also um, how gender, how consumption is very gendered. And in that sense, I think my eyes almost too critical. 
two biases. Because I think I've stopped taking the pure street photography these days, and I'm kind of this working idea of what's going on. And that kind of limits my photography, or focuses it, depending on what you, what you think. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that you're limiting your topics? I definitely think I'm limiting it a lot. Because I try to go back to pure street fashion these days, but it's kind of hard. This is a kind of... Nowadays, I'm thinking about, about a lot about what people are doing um, as much as what they're wearing. So it's kind of a mix of both, which is one reason I think street fashion, there's a million street fashion photographers these days who run around and are doing, you know, their pet peeve. I don't know if you've heard of the pet peeve. The passion people, the pet peeve are running around trying to become well-known as fashion people. Um, but they're, they don't like my photography at all because it's too, it's not about just the clothes. It's about something else. I think they just don't like the, the nemesis saying of it. It's just a little bit, it's just doing something weird. We don't like it. I think that's the part that remains from before. But, um, yeah, it's not pure street anymore. I think that's definitely true. Which is one reason I'm kind of disappointed and a little bit bored by street fashion photography. Because the problem is, I actually, you know, I go to Seoul Fashion Week every season now, because I do lots of runway stuff and I try to relate, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I hate fashion people. That's the secret. I don't like these people at all. <laughs> Most of the peppy that I interact with, I kind of swallow in my bile a little bit. I mean, <laughs> kind of a snob. I, I wasn't that kind of person when I was their age. And I think a lot of the, my working theory, don't, don't tell them, I feel kind of bad about saying this, is um, they want to be peppy because now they can they can raise their social capital quite a bit because they've got a social capital deficit in other traditional areas. I've noticed these days most of the peppy that I introduce, that I, that I stop, ones who are like, oh yeah, you know, you walk by them and you say, oh, oh, sajinyo? Yeah, they're ready, they're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Those people, actually, I kind of find them strange because and I kind of look down on them. I don't think it's a good thing because a lot of them didn't finish high school. A lot of them are not in, quote unquote, good colleges that Koreans would consider. They're, if they're in Seoul, they're third tier Seoul colleges, right? They're at the Chibang. They come into Hongdae for the weekend to be peppy, to get attention. And I kind of feel guilty for not liking them, but also for kind of stoking the fires of their hopes that they'll suddenly become famous because this foreign photographer is taking my picture. I think they have their own idea of what's going on, which isn't at all true. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of weird things happening with the fact that I don't actually like my subjects very much. I think that comes out in the, uh, some of the pictures. I think we have to stop there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we can go on after <laughs> in private, or if you've got time for a, a beer. Always have time for beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's his birthday too. So, once more, thank you very much.